are listening to the Ali Podcast, Season 1. Season 1, Episode 3, Cultivating a Virtuous Character. اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم everyone um, a few things uh, first uh, uh, please forgive me I'm getting over a flu and uh, my nose is blocked and my throat is a little sore uh, if I'm unclear please uh, type it into the chat there and uh, I will try my best to be more clear um, uh, I guess we'll start. Uh, I want to begin uh, for thanking. I want to begin by thanking all of you for being here tonight. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity uh, from Ali, the Academy of uh, Learning Islam, to give this course. Um, I think it would be a good idea for me uh, to start by introducing myself very briefly and giving you a little bit of my educational background. Uh, so my name, uh, for those of you who don't know, is Erfan Jaffer. Um, I did my Bachelor of Arts degree at York University, and I focused on the subjects of Islam and uh, philosophy. After that, I went to Syria for a year where I studied Arabic. Then I came back. Uh, I did my master's at uh, the University of Toronto in the Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations Department. I focused on Islamic history and Islamic philosophy. And um, after that, I went back to York University, where I completed my PhD, uh, and the uh, title of my uh, dissertation was um, Traditional Islamic Ethics, the Concept of Virtue, and Its Implications for Contemporary Human Rights. Uh, over the last few years, I've given a few talks at a number of universities, uh, interfaith in- institutions, as well as Islamic organizations. Uh, so, as you know, this is course um, 525 called Cultivating a Virtuous uh, Character. Um, sorry, just give me one second here. Okay, so the course is broken up into three different sections, um, each one for the next Tuesday. Uh, and I really hope that you will be able to attend all three of the sessions because they build upon each other. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak for a little while and then I'm going to pause for any questions that you might have and I will be happy to answer them. So what you can do is in the chat section that you have over there is when I pause for questions, you can type in any question and uh, inshallah I will see it and I will try my best to answer it um, if it's easy enough to answer. Um, so the... so. Uh, uh, okay, so today, the, today's class or today's talk will explore the Islamic idea of human nature um, and the importance of cultivating virtue and will discuss the human being's role as servants and representatives of God. The second week will be more practical, so next week. Uh, it will look at the role of different Islamic practices such as fasting and prayer and how they function to transform our souls on the inside and make us truly human beings. Uh, that is people of beauty or ihsan. Uh, and the last section will talk about modernity um, and the barriers that we face today in cultivating this virtuous character. This is really important because modernity is the world that we live in and it subconsciously influences the way that we act and we think. And so we have to know uh, how this influences us so that we can rise above it or that we can move through it or beyond it. Okay, so those are the three different classes. So as I said, the first part of this talk will start by talking about the two natures of the human being, as well as the concept of free will. After that, so that's the first section. After that, we'll move on to explain the difference between being and doing or between um, uh, essence and action. That's the second part. And then the third and final part of this talk will discuss the dual role of the human being as both servants and representatives of God in this world. Uh, and why we can only, again, be fully human uh, when we fulfill these two roles. 
Okay, so over here, um, and also one of the things I wanted to say was forgive me, uh, this is my first online course, so if I'm a little slow with the slides. So here we see the session one outline, human nature and free will, then doing versus being, and finally the human function as servants and representatives of God. Okay, uh, so let's get started. So according to the Quran, human beings have two distinct natures. The first nature is physical, temporal, and base. It comes from the parts of us that are made for this dunya, and uh, like the coarse body, and they will not join us in the hereafter. For example, the Quran describes the human being as creatures that are fashioned from dust, mud, and water. So accordingly, in Surah 30, verse 20, we read, And one of his signs is that he created you from dust. Then lo, you are mortals who scatter. Um, moreover, the Quran describes this type of worldly human being as one that is inclined, to or inclined towards ingratitude, heedlessness, and ignorance. This, kind of this is the kind of person whose heart is hard and therefore has lost connection with the divine presence. For example, in, verse, in Surah 14, verse 34, we, wrote, we read, And he gives you all that you ask of him. And if you count Allah's favors, you will not be able to number them. Most surely man is very unjust, very ungrateful. And then we'll get the slide. Okay, so on the other hand, however, so we have this one worldly nature that is ungrateful. But on the other hand, the Quran also describes human beings as spiritual, eternal, and pure. This nature comes from the parts of us that are made for the Akhirah like the purified soul, and will not remain in the physical world after we die or pass on. For example, the Quran describes the <coughs> human being as creatures that contain the breath of God within them. In Surah 38, verses 71 to 72, it states, When your Lord said to the angel, Surely I am going to create a mortal from dust. So when I have made him complete and breathe into him of my spirit, then fall down making obeisance to him. Moreover, the Quran describes a spiritual human being as one that is inclined towards gratitude, patience, and remembrance. This is the kind of person whose inner heart is alive and lives in a state of taqwa or God consciousness. For example, in Surah 3, verse 134, we read, Those who spend benevolently in ease as well as in straightness, as those who restrain their anger and pardon men, and Allah, lovers, and Allah loves the doers of good. So this polarity between this polarity between these two human natures is captured by the Islamic view that human beings have the ability to be better than angels or baser than animals and this is possible because God gave human beings the gift of free will they are the only creatures in the seen world uh, so not jinns but they are the only creatures in the free, in, in the seen world that can choose to obey or disobey God Again, in Surah 76, verse 3 to 4, it says, Surely we have created man from a small life German uniting itself. We mean to try him, so we have made him hearing, seeing. Surely we have shown him the way. He may be thankful or unthankful. Imam's, Imam Ali's constant admonitions also presuppose that human beings can be both good and bad, and moreover, that they have the free will to choose between right and wrong. More directly, however, someone asked Imam Ali and Najra Balaga in relation to fighting about the question of free will. And the answer that Imam Ali gave is the following. If by destiny you mean a compulsion through which we are forced to do a thing, then it is not so. Had it been an obligation of that kind, there would have been no question of reward for doing it and punishment for not doing it. Then the promised blessings and punishments in life after death will have no meaning. Therefore, human beings have two potential natures and they can choose between them. They can be godly creatures or they can be worldly creatures. Now, it's very simple um, and we're going to move on to more, a slightly more complicated things. But I'm going to stop here for a second and ask uh, if anyone has any questions. Again, if you do, just type it into the box over there and uh, I will see it. And I'll wait a minute uh, for you to type. And if nothing comes up, we'll move on to the next section, inshallah. Okay, so it seems like there's no questions. 
which is good because I'm going to assume it means it was clear. Um, okay, so I want to move on to the next section, which is being versus doing. Now, it is extremely important at this point for us to speak, but speak about what we mean by the word nature. By the word nature, we mean essence or state of being. In other words, we are talking about what a person is and not what a person does. Let's use an example to make this a little clearer. When we say a person is a happy person, we are describing their fundamental nature. We are describing who they are and not what they do. There are many people who do, sorry, excuse me. There are many people who do things to feel happy. Um, there are many people who do things to feel happy, but they're still unhappy on the inside. On the other hand, there are people who feel sad at times, but they're still considered to be happy people. So what matters then is your state of being or your nature or your essence. From an Islamic perspective, this is important because there are many people who do good deeds, but still their hearts are very hard. In this case, God says that their actions will have no effect. For example, move to the next slide. For example, in Surah 14, verse 18, it says, The deeds of those who deny the existence of their Lord are like ashes blown about by a strong wind on a stormy day. They will achieve nothing from their deeds. What they have done is a manifest error. On the other hand, the more godly a person is, the more difficult it is that, the more godly a person it is, the more, (laughs) forgive me. On the other hand, the more godly a person is, the more difficult it is for that person by their very nature to commit ungodly acts. Of course, being and doing work together. Um, A godly or virtuous person naturally does more good deeds, and the more good deeds that godly or virtuous person does, the more godly and virtuous they become. However, what I'm trying to say is that a person's state of being is primary, and therefore the most important aspect of good deeds is that it is transformative. This is why this course is about cultivating a virtuous character and not about doing good deeds as such. The principal primacy of a person's state of being is emphasized by the Quran, the Prophet, and Imam Ali. For example, in the Quran, Surah 49, verse 14, we read, The wandering Arabs say, We believe. Say unto them, O Muhammad, you believe not, but rather say, We submit. For the faith has not yet entered into your hearts. Yet, if you obey Allah and his messenger, he will not withhold from you anything of the reward of your deeds. Lo, Allah is forgiving, most merciful. So in this verse, the Bedouin Arabs come to the Prophet and tell them that they have iman, or faith. In other words, they tell them that their states of being, their insides, have turned from disbelief to belief. However, God tells the Prophet to correct them. This is because the Bedouin Arabs haven't, learned, haven't changed their essences, but rather they have only changed their actions. They are now obeying God and His Messenger, but this does not mean they have transformed themselves on the inside and attained the higher level of Iman as opposed to the lower level of Islam. In the same light, the Quran also says in Surah 26, verse 88 to 89, the day whereon, so it's talking about the day of judgment, the day whereon neither wealth nor sons will avail, but only he will prosper that brings to Allah a sound heart. So here we see that salvation primarily depends on the health of a person's soul and their inner heart. This is why it is reported that the Prophet said, the status of a Muslim is in accordance with his state of ikhlas or sincerity. Now these same ideas are seen also in the teachings of Imam Ali. Uh, we'll go back to this slide. Okay, in the teachings of Imam Ali. Uh, in Najra Balaga, for example, he says, A virtuous person is better than a virtue, and a vicious person is worse than a vice. Again, he also says, The sin which makes you sad and repentant is more liked by Allah than the sin that makes you arrogant. Okay, so again, we see here that the emphasis is not on the action as such, but the state that that action creates within you. Interestingly, some Muslim intellectuals have argued that the consequences of an action will be positive or negative depending on the state of your heart. 
So a person who has a, is in a good or godly state, even if they do something wrong, eventually and ultim- ultimately, their action will have good consequences in the world. On the other hand, if a person has a hard heart and tries to do a good action, ultimately, in the end, that action will result in negative things. Uh, I'll stop here uh, after this being and doing and ask again if anyone has any questions. Uh, again, if so, just type it in and I will be, I will try my best to answer them. And I'll wait a minute. Um, let's see. No questions? All right. Okay. So, all of this uh, leads us to uh, our next question, which is an important question. And that is, what is our essence as human beings, and what makes this essence godly or ungodly? I should mention here that in Islamic thought, there are subtle and important differences between the soul, the heart, and their connection to the spirit. However, we don't have the time to get into that, and I don't think it's too important for the purposes of this course, so we'll leave it aside. Um, We'll change the slide here. Okay. So, according to the Quran, each person has a soul, and it is this soul that is the essence of the human being. For example, in the Quran, Surah 2, verse 281, it says, And guard yourselves against the day in which you shall be returned to Allah, and every soul shall be paid back in full for what it has earned, and they shall not be dealt with unjustly. So, it is the type of soul that we have that defines us, and dictates what will happen to us in the next life. For example, the Quran talks about three different types of souls. Okay, here we have these three different types of souls that the Quran talks about. Uh, the first soul is called uh, the Nafs al-Amara. And this is the soul that tempts us towards doing evil acts or evil deeds. The second soul is known as Nafs al and it's known as the self-reproaching soul. It's the soul that is constantly trying to correct us to do better and to do good. The last and final soul that the Quran describes is Nafsa Mutma'inna. And this is the soul that is content or at peace. And this is because it lives with God and through God. From this point of view, the soul, which is the essence of the human being, can be worldly or godly. In this sense, it is the battleground which decides the destiny of a person. Okay? In this regard, Imam Ali states, The world is an abode of transience that leads to an abode of permanence. People in it are of two types. One sells his soul and thereby destroys it. The other buys his soul and thereby frees it. Okay. The soul that is destroyed is the the soul that has given in or surrendered itself to the material world. This type of person is human in appearance but has become material in essence. This is because you are what your soul is. Let's use an example of the mind to understand how this happens. God has given us a mind and the ability to, ability to think, so that we can um, has given us ability to think, so that we can use it as a tool to attain certain things in this world, such as a car, a career, a house, so on and so forth. These things that we attain are not bad in and of themselves. It is okay to own things, of course. The problem is when things start to own you. For example, when a person loses their house, they may feel as though they have lost a part of themselves. You'll see when this happens that they become dejected and depressed. And this shows that the material world has attached itself onto that person's sense of identity or onto their essence. This is interesting because nothing has actually happened to the person as such. The problem is that the material world is controlling how they think, how they act, and how they feel instead of the other way around. Everything within the, instead of the other way around. We were created to control the material world. Everything within the human body has a specific place and function. Imam Ali, for example, states, Sorry, uh, same, same slide. Okay. So Imam Ali, for example, states, the intellect is a king and characteristics are its subjects. So if it is weak in governing, governing them, disorder takes place. 
Okay. When the human soul is not in control, then at the time of de death, it will be difficult for it to leave those things which control it. A person's desires, for example, will latch onto the soul and drag it down instead of allowing the soul to freely return back to God. This is how a human becomes subhuman or less than human. Some people believe that the best way to avoid this problem is to avoid the mind and thinking altogether. So you know of hermits, for example, who go away into the desert to get that peace and quiet, to quiet their desires and their minds so that they can experience something of that higher reality. Um, however, from the Islamic point of view, the point is not to get rid of it, but the point is to keep your mind and your thoughts under the control of your higher nature. In other words, every part of you should be guided by the power of God, or in other words, your transformed and enlightened soul. The Prophet, for example, lived in, a, lived in society as a shepherd and as a merchant, as well as a husband and a father. However, he did these things as a servant and messenger of God. In this way, Islam integrates the sacred and profane spheres into one, and this is part of the concept of Tawheed. On the human plane, Tawheed is the act of taking all the, multiplic all the multiplicity that is inherent in the human state and bringing it into a state of harmony and unity. This is what removes the disorder, confusion, and chaos that we all seem to face at different times in our lives. In any case, from an Islamic perspective, we should not get rid of the lower parts of our nature because they are gifts that were given to us by God to help us live in this world. To reiterate, when we talk about a person's nature or essence, what we are really talking about is the part of a person that is dominant or in control. The important thing is to not let our gifts that were given to us by God lead us away from who we truly are. Okay? Uh, we have a question here. Uh, we have two questions here. Okay, so we will pause here for a second. Okay, so the first question is, when a person who has a hard heart can't do good ever? Okay, no. Uh, so, it's an excellent question. There is, um, there is, so, I, I, I will talk about how I'm talking about two extremes. Um, the hardness or softness of a heart goes in different degrees and stages, okay? Now, every human being has a heart and has the ability to transform that heart um, into a godly heart. So as long as you don't reach a certain um, stage of hardness, you always have the opportunity, inshallah, to correct yourself. So a person who has a hard heart, if he turns away from the God, away from the world and turns towards God, and also uses actions to transform him or herself, then their heart can, again, regain the consciousness of God. Um, there is a state, however, where your heart becomes so hardened, then it becomes impossible to reform. And these are the people, so for example, we read in the Quran about how God, in Surah Yasin, for example, how God has put um, chains around their necks, um, and uh, he will lead them astray. Now, it's not that God is saying, Oh, there's a person here, the person is neutral, and I'm going to lead this person astray. No, it's that the person um, has, their heart has become so hardened that they will now follow on that path. Um, that path. Uh, so, again, there are many degrees, and uh, one should never lose hope in the mercy of God. In fact, that's considered to be a sin, in, um, according to Islam, uh, losing hope in the mercy of God. So it's 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 um, only for a very um, far stage. Uh, I hope that answered the question. If not, you can type something else. The other question is, uh, you mentioned that there are three types of souls. Uh, so soul is not ruh. Ruh, ruh is usually uh, spirit. But anyway, they are nafse, uh, mutmainna, lawama, and amara. Isn't the nafse different entity than the ruh? Yes, it is. Um, and so I said I didn't want to get into the differences between all of them because um, it's it's a little technical. And again, I don't think it's too important for this course. Um, so just to finish with that, uh, the the Ru is uh, the Quran says we actually have very little knowledge of the Ru and it's the spirit. 
the nafs is the self, the human self, which can be low, lowly, worldly, or it can be high and godly. Um, and yeah, so and there's a difference. So the spirit actually connects with the ruh, and it can enlighten it. Okay, so think of it as uh, the sun. And the rays of the sun is the root or the spirit which comes down and it can hit the soul, the nafs, the self, and it can enlighten it. Okay, but if it doesn't receive that light, then it can become darkened, the soul. Okay, uh, and the follow up question to that was if someone with a hard heart intends to do a good deed with a good intention while they do not realize that they have a hard heart. What if someone with a hard heart intends to do a good deed with a pure intention while they do not realize that they have a hard heart? Well, the, and this is part of uh, the point that I'm making, is that what matters is not the action but the essence. And something that's connected to the essence very intimately is the intention. So if someone has the intention of doing good, then their essence is not uh, one that is of a hard heart. Their essence is already... Uh, the fact that their intention is good means that their essence is already one that is not uh, hard. And so, yeah, uh, so um, uh, so if someone with a hard heart intends to do a good deed with a pure intention while they do not realize. Yeah, so that pure attention shows that they do not have a hard heart. Um, if that if that answers the question. Thank you. OK, so it does. Uh, is everyone clear on that? Uh, any other follow-up questions before I move on? No? Okay. Um, let's move to the next slide. Okay. Uh, so this brings us to the question of our, how, of our higher nature. Uh, our higher nature is a state wherein everything we do is guided by the power of God. In other words, it is when our earthly nature is controlled and guided by our virtuous or godly nature, right? We said whatever is dominant. Uh, the ultimate goal, so the ultimate goal of this state is captured in the following hadith. And I'm going to read this out to you. It's a very uh, interesting hadith. Uh, it's God saying to the Prophet to tell us. Uh, so it's a hadith qudsi And the most beloved thing which my slave comes nearer to me is what I have enjoined on him, what I have made, uh, what what is wajib upon him. After that, the most <coughs> beloved thing to God, and that makes the slave go closer to him, is performing extra good deeds, nawafil. Until God, so it's, God says, till I love him, so I become his sense of hearing with which he hears, and his sense of sight with which he sees, and his hand with which he grips, and his leg with which he walks. And if he asks me, I will give him. And if he asks me my protection, I will protect him. Okay? And so here, I'm talking about two extremes, the highest and lowest of human nature. Of course, there is a mix. And I think it's fair to say that most of us are in the middle. However, I think it's important to talk about the extremes because that shows us uh, a goal to strive towards as well as something to stay away from. Okay. So, in order to understand our true and higher nature, it's important to understand the purpose of our creation. In other words, it is important to understand what God created us to do and to be. This is because it is only when we fulfill our purpose that we can become fully human. Okay, I'm going to repeat that again. This is because it is only when we fulfill our purpose that we can become fully human. And let's, I'm going to give you an example so that it's a little clearer why. If someone creates a sofa, its purpose is for people to sit down or lie down on the sofa. That's its purpose. That's its reason for existence. If the sofa is used as a doorstop, for example, then it's no longer fulfilling its purpose, and therefore it's only a sofa now in appearance. Similarly, we have been created for a purpose, and if we do not fulfill this purpose, then we are only being human in appearance and not in reality or not in essence. Okay? So this is a topic that I want to turn to now. Okay? Um, and inshallah, in our next class, uh, I want to discuss the practical ways that we can use Islamic rites and rituals in order to transform ourselves into godly creatures, or in other words, in order to fulfill our role and purpose here on earth. 
okay? And um, so I hope you'll be there for that class because it'll be very practical and things you can do in your everyday lives to actually uh, create this change as opposed to talking about it. Many, I think that many of the lectures we go to, we hear about all these uh, great things we can do and um, the, the great human potential there is, but we don't really get the practical steps day to day of what we can uh, do. Uh, so uh, I hope that next week you'll come and I hope it will benefit you. Uh, in any case, the Quran speaks about the function or role of the human being in relation to God in two different ways. Okay, uh, The first and foremost is that the human being is the servant or the ab of God. Okay, So the servant or abd of God. Uh, and let me just check the slide here. The slide is good. Uh, so in Surah 51 verse 56, it says, and I have not created the jinn and men except that they should serve me. To be a servant, okay, is a passive role because it means to listen or to obey your master. On the exoteric or formal plane, which means on the outward plane, it means to follow the commandments of God as prescribed to us in the Quran and the Hadith literature. This includes praying, fasting, giving charity, being kind to others, so on and so forth, correct? However, on the esoteric or spiritual plane, on the inward plane, um, <clears throat> being a servant of God means to be in a state of surrender or acceptance of God's will. Okay? It means to be in a state of surrender or acceptance of God's will. In fact, the very different definition of Islam could be uh, the very definition of Islam could be the attainment of peace through surrender to the divine will. So here we have a doing and a being. What you have to do is follow God's law, and what you have to be is in a state of surrender. Now, the state of surrender is extremely important because it is only when we are in this state that we are truly able to receive from God's mercy. It is only ourselves and our desires and our thinking that get in the way of receiving everything that we need in our lives. Take the example of a farmer, okay? Take the example of a farmer who receives plenty of sun and rain all the time, but yet that farmer cannot grow anything. Obviously, the problem is that this farmer has planted his seed in unfertile ground, okay? In the same way, our heart is like a seed. Okay, God's mercy is like the sun and the rain because it is constantly coming down upon us. The problem is the soil, is our state of being. In order for our heart to grow, which is the seed, we need to have it in the fertile soil of a surrendered state of being. Okay, so when we are in that state, we have created the proper soil for God to allow God to let us flourish and grow. Okay, because it is ultimately God who makes these changes and not us. Okay, of course, this does not apply to Muslims alone. This is because the word Muslim in its verbal form means someone who surrenders or accepts. Okay, so if it, for example, is snowing outside and a Muslim complains about the situation while a Christian happily accept it, accepts it, then in this case, the Christian is being more Muslim than the Muslim. Okay. Now, uh, in any case, when it comes to the station of servanthood, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq connects the outward and inward states of surrender by saying the following. Since the slave of Allah has left his affairs to Allah, the problems of the world become easy for him. And since he spends all his time doing what Allah has told him to do or staying away from what Allah has told him to stay away from, then he has no, no time left to be pretentious. Thus, Allah honors his slave by means of these three things, and because of this, shaitan's challenges become easy for him, and his interaction with other, pre with other creatures of Allah also become easy. Okay, So we're seeing here that these two types of surrenders are connected. Okay, uh, Following God's commands leads to a state of being, of surrender, which is a state of peace, as this hadith is shown. The famous Islamic poet and mystic Rumi says the following, Love is when God says to you, 
I've created everything for you, and you say, I have left everything for you. So when we put these two, to, when we put these two things together, we can see that serving God leads one to a state of surrender which is made up of peace and even love. Surrendering to God is not for the sake of God, obviously, because God does not need anything. This surrender is for us. In fact, the idea of the importance of outer and inner, inner surrender is unanimous among the world's major religions. Every religion has this idea in some form or of another. According to the 18th century Christian priest William Law, he says the following, You may know with the utmost certainty that if you have no inward peace, if religious comfort is still wanting, then it is because you have more will than one. For the multiplicity of wills is the very essence of fallen nature. As soon as you return to allow only this one will, you are returned to God and find the blessedness of his kingdom within you. Thus, when we surrender ourselves, we experience something more beautiful than we can imagine. We experience the peace and love of God as well as his guidance in every single situation of every single aspect of our lives. I cannot explain this state to you because it is something that you have to experience. But I will say that once you experience this state one day, inshallah, uh, you, will be, you will be amazed at the beauty inside of each and every individual. Um, now, uh, uh, let's stop for questions here for a second. Uh, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Also, it doesn't have to be a question. It can be a clarification. Again, uh, if something wasn't understood, please uh, uh, do ask. Okay, I'm not seeing anything, so I will continue. Okay, so uh, where are we? Uh, okay, so I want to return to the story of creation to further other understand our role on earth. Um, according to the Quran, in a life before this one, God assembled uh, the children of Adam and asked them, Am I not your Lord? And all of the children of Adam answered in the affirmative. In other words, all of them said, Yes, you are our Lord. This is one of the reasons that human beings cannot say, I did not know on the day of judgment that I was supposed to serve God. Of course, many people will say, Well, why not? I don't really remember this event happening. Um, in response, the Quran places particular emphasis on the act of remembrance or dhikr uh, in general and on the connection between forgetfulness and wrongdoing in particular. It continuously highlights the fact that everything, the prophets, the scriptures, the signs of God, all of it, are only given to us in order to remind us of what we already know. Um, and or what is already part of our fitra, that is our innate human nature. So humanity not only testified to the existence of God, but it also willingly accepted the station of servanthood. Okay, and uh, this is seen in the verse of the trust, the amana. It reads, uh, and it's in Surah 33, verse 72 to 73. It says, "We did indeed offer the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains." But they refused to undertake it, being afraid thereof. But man undertook it. He was indeed unjust and foolish, with the result that Allah has to punish the hypocrites, men and women, and the unbelievers, men and women. And Allah turns in mercy to the believers, men and women, for Allah is oft forgiving most merciful. So although humans were unjust and foolish, according to this verse, God provided them with the ability to fulfill this trust. And this leads us to the second role or function of human beings in relation to God. So the first we said was a station of servanthood, which again is not for God, but is for us because it leads us to a state of surrender and a state of love. So a state of peace and a state of love and a state of guidance. Okay. And the second role is, um, lead us to the second role or function. Uh, we'll move this here. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that, men and women. Okay, so although humans were unjust and foolish, God provided them with the ability to fulfill, fulfill their trust, and this leads us to the second role of 
or function of the human being in relation to God. Along with being servants of God, human beings are also God's representatives or khalifas on earth. Inshallah, we'll discuss this in detail next week because representing God is intimately connected with the things that you have to do in order to transform yourselves. So the practical things that you have to do. And so next week, inshallah, I hope to start with what it means to represent God on earth and then talk about the things we can do, the steps we can take to fulfill that role. For now, I want to just reiterate the main point, which is that it's extremely important to realize that the very essence of the human nature or the human state is attached to the two stations of servanthood and representation. It is only by serving and representing God on earth that a person can become insan akamil or a complete and true human being. Um, I have I have some stuff here about this uh, station of representation, but uh, we have about 15 minutes uh, before uh, the end of the course, and so I want to answer any questions. It can be directly related to the talk or anything around the talk, uh, around the subject matter. Uh, it doesn't matter, but I think it's really important to give people a chance to voice what they think and how uh, they feel and uh, clarify anything that was misunderstood so that next week there's no misunderstandings when we continue, inshallah. Okay, uh, so if you do have anything, uh, please um, go ahead and ask. I see one. Um, in this concept of achieving a higher state, so the question, sorry, I should say it out loud. Uh, in this concept of achieving a higher state and being connected with God 24-7, directly related to spirituality, Irfan, or Sufism? Uh, absolutely 100%. Uh, it is related to Irfan or Sufism. Sufism tends to be the uh, Sunni Muslim um uh, Sunni Muslims, the group of Sunni Muslims who focus on the spiritual aspects of Islam. Uh, not that they neglect the other aspects, but they focus on those. And Irfan is more so the Shia um, way of doing it. Uh, but, you know, they are very similar and they overlap all the time. Um, and they're really two branches of the same tree, I think, in my opinion. Um, so yes, this higher state is, but it's, I, I, I kind of hesitate to say that this higher state is connected to su, spirit, su, Irfan or Sufism because it makes it seem like it's something that's, uh, you know, exclusive and something meant for just a few people. But really Islam is a complete way of life and to be human is to be human. And I think that we all have to achieve, um, a certain essence or a certain state that is godly. Um, and that's the reason we're here on earth. And if we don't achieve that state, then, um, you know, that's the purpose of life. So we're not fulfilling our purpose. So everybody, what, what is important to remember in this is that everybody has a different uh, capacity. Okay. So, um, every, it's important for everyone to reach this state according to their capacity, whether they subscribe to Irfan or uh, Sufism or not, it doesn't matter. But according to your capacity, you should try your best to achieve this state no matter what. Um, it seems to be the people who are uh, in these groups that we call Sufism or Irfan, um, they're just, um, their capacity or their interest in it seems to be really great. Uh, but again, that's not, um, that's not saying that other people shouldn't be doing it. Um, they should be, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions? Again, we have about 10 minutes. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I really, I, I find that that is most, was there anything unclear, anything? Yeah, nothing? Okay, thank you. Uh, like you said, that everyone has a different capacity in achieving this higher state, the ideal uh, end goal for every Muslim according to everyone's capacity. Um, okay, so achieving this higher state is the ideal end goal for every Muslim according to the capacity. It is the ideal goal, yes, 
uh, but that comes with a qualification. Okay, so God created everyone with um, a natural talents. Um, so everybody was created with different strengths and weaknesses, and uh, there's divine wisdom behind that. Uh, we need all types of people in this world for this world to function. If everybody was consumed with uh, just spirituality and nothing else, then the world would break down. So, you know, sometimes you see people, for example, uh, they're very focused on saving, I don't know, the dolphins in the ocean. And you might think to yourself, well, why are you so focused on saving the dolphins in the ocean when there are human beings that are starving? Uh, and the reason is we need people to take care of every aspect uh, of the issues that are going on in this world for this world to continue to function in a harmonious and balanced way. So it is the ideal state of every human being. But again, according to their capacity, for some people, um, their job and role on this earth might be, again, for example, to take care of the dolphins or to look after the needy, the orphans. Some, so generally uh, in religion, we say that there are three paths to God. The first path is the path of service. The second path is the path of love and devotion. And the third path is the path of spirituality and wisdom. So any of these three paths can lead the servant or the person to, to God. So a person who is devoted to God is generally a person who, who is just, uh, loves doing the prayers, loves fasting, loves reciting dua, and they're very devoted people. Then the person who is, uh, who approaches God through works is a person who is like an activist, right? They, uh, organize people, they make movements, uh, they stand up against wrong, and this leads them to God because that's their nature. The third person of wisdom, uh, this is the state I'm talking about. But again, this state filters down to all the other levels too, and so each person's natural Capacity also includes the spiritual state, but just to a lower level than someone who's inclined towards the spiritual side of it. Uh, I hope that made sense. Okay, uh, we have another one here. Just to clarify, God uh, represents God represents our prophets and imams who are masum. We are mere human who make gods. How can we represent God? Oh, good. I, I actually wanted to... <laughs> well, now that I'm reading it, I wanted to answer this question, or I want to answer this question. Okay. Uh, a couple interesting things here. When we say that the, uh, the imams are infallible, masum, they can't make... They can't do... Uh, uh, they can't sin. It's very important to understand this, is that um, the more godly your essence is, the more impossible it becomes for you to sin. So it's not that you can or can't sin or you're fighting against sin. It's that your essence has become so godly and it's controlling every other part of you so that all the other parts of you that are able to sin can no longer sin because your transformed soul or the guidance of God is stopping it. So you might, for example, come across a bad thought and all of a sudden you'll realize that your thinking won't let you go there. Okay? And so that's a beautiful thing. Now, every single human being has the potential to be like the prophets and the imams according to their capacity, the human being's capacity. Now, the prophets and the imams' capacity is much greater than our capacity, <clears throat> excuse me, is much greater than our capacity, and we would not say we will become like the prophets and the imams. We won't. But... There's a reason that God sent them down, right? In the Quran, it says that the, ex the Prophet is a beautiful example for us to follow. If we cannot in some level or in some capacity be like the Prophet or the Imams, right, on our own level, then it, he wouldn't, the Prophet and the Imams wouldn't make very good examples because then we could say, well, we can't be like them because they're so high up and we have no nothing in similar so they're not a very good example. An example is good only if you can follow it, correct? And this is one of the things that we really need to understand is that when we say that we are Shia Muslims, being a Shia Muslim is not about uh, always uh, talking about praising the Imams and how much we love them. That's fine. But it's about acting the way they acted and more importantly, becoming the way that they were 
in their essence or in their state. So again, to reiterate, we might not have their capacity or the as high a capacity as they do, but we do have it in us, right? Because the verse I read about uh, representing God is that God breathed his verse. So God has breathed his spirit into Adam, which means all human beings. And so we have that in us. And that's a divine inner spark that we have in us that we just need to activate. Um, and you'll see, for example, it's not just for the prophets and imams. Kither, who is um, not considered, there is a little dispute about it, but Kither is in a story with uh, the prophet Musa, Nabi Musa. And in this, Kither is, in terms of knowledge, at a higher rank than Nabi Musa. And Nabi Musa says, can I follow you, Kither, so that you can teach me something of the higher knowledge that you were given? So this person who was not a prophet or an imam was blessed with guidance from God. And the prophet himself is asking, can I follow you so that you can teach me? And in the end, Musa, Nabi Musa was not able to continue his journey because his capacity did not match that of Kithar's in this regard. Okay, In other regards, it might have surpassed Kithar's. Okay, uh, I hope that's clear. Uh, so we have another one. Do we create this capacity or Allah gives us that? How do we increase it? Alhamdulillah. This is, this is beautiful. So do we create this capacity or does Allah give it to us? And how do we create it? So this goes back to my example of the farmer. Um, and Rumi, again, if I, if you don't, uh, if, if I can quote him again, says, our, our goal is not to achieve love. Our goal is to remove all the obstacles that stop us from feeling love. In the same way, our goal is we we cannot um, achieve this by ourselves. All of this comes from God. Everything comes from God. It's all from the grace of God. However, what we can do is put ourselves in a state where we are able to receive that mercy and that grace from God so that he can make our hearts grow and flourish. Okay? So the question is um, that God does give it to us, but we have to be active in, um, one, asking for it, and two, allowing for it to come to us, okay, as opposed to going out and trying to get it. In today's modern world, there's this idea that we always have to be um, doing something to get something, okay? This is not, in 1400 years of Islamic history, this was not the way things were understood, there was a lot of um, emphasis placed on being quiet and in a state of surrender so that God could do things to you as opposed to you go out to try and do godly things or to reach God. Um, so there is a mix here. You, there is an action. There is some active aspect that you have to take care of. But in the end, to reach the state that I'm talking about, the highest state, it is all by the grace of God. That highest state cannot come except by God, right? Um, but uh, we can put ourselves, we can try, inshallah, to put ourselves in the best position to receive that grace from God. Uh, so we have about five more minutes. Uh, one more question, maybe, um, if someone has, or one more clarification. Or if I didn't clarify or answer one of the questions well, I can give it another try. Um, yeah, just. Um, feel free. No. Okay. It looks like that's it. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, so, yes. So, um, when we talk about humans as servants and representatives of God, uh, it will become, uh, there, there is, uh, it gets in depth and it can become a little technical. Uh, but I don't think we have to worry about, we worry a lot about, uh, understanding things. Um, I think we have to, um, place our concern on, um, uh, changing things. Uh, it's it's if you don't understand something but you are being transformed on the inside 
that transformation comes with knowledge. So if you don't understand something, instead of trying your best to, and I'm not saying don't do it, I'm just pointing to the other side of it also. Um, sometimes just by putting yourself in the right state and place, then you can uh, um, receive the knowledge of something that you didn't understand before. And so you'll go and you'll say, oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't read a book to learn it, but now I know it. And that's what an enlightened state can bring you, knowledge. Uh, question added. I, I don't see the, I see it says question added, but I don't see the question in the chat. Um, uh, can we add that question to the chat section? Uh, typed out. It's maybe it was uh, sent to me privately. Um, no, uh, I'm not sure. Even, uh, yeah, so, uh, there, I, I saw, um, a little, um, thing on my screen flash up that there was a question added, but the question wasn't added to the chat section, so I'm not able to see it. Okay, here I see two questions now. Um, so one is, could you go over being and doing again? Um, I'll, I'll summarize it very quickly, if that's okay. Um, being is a state, okay? It's a state or an essence. It's who you are on the inside. Doing is an action, okay? Uh, now, the more good things you do, the better your state becomes. And the better your state becomes, the more good things you do. But what is first and primary is your state, is your essence. And on the Day of Judgment in the Quran, God will look at your deeds as well as your state. But it says, it always says, those who believe, which is a state of belief, and those who do good deeds, showing that belief is primary. So the most important thing that we need to do is change our essence, our insides, who we are as people. And the example I gave was of a happy person. A happy person is, we're describing someone who's happy by their very natures, not someone who does things to be happy. Right, Because if you do things to be happy, like many people in this world today, you can still be very unhappy on the inside. And so that's the main difference between doing and being. Uh, being is an is. Uh, acting is a doing. Uh, and also we have one more. Can you please elaborate on how surrender brings peace and love? Yeah, yes. Um, so... so when you put yourself in a state of surrender, there's two levels, as I said. The first level of surrender is to follow God's laws and commands. What happens when you follow laws, God's laws and commands is that you're no longer worried about this situation and that situation because you know what the right thing to do is. So instead of horizontally um, being in a state of indecision and um, confusion and disorder, you are in a state of uh, kind of uh, you're at a state of peace because you know everything. So you can kind of turn your attention vertically towards God now and moving towards him. So. Um, <clears throat> so surrendering to God's will. Um, so I, this was going to be part of my next talk, but to be in a state of surrender means to accept that everything, accept everything that happens in this world to us as part of God's will. So when you know that God is all good and all compassionate, then everything that happens in this world, you'll see that God's compassion and mercy is behind it. So when you're able to see God's compassion and mercy behind everything that happens in this world, then you become at a state of surrender and peace because instead of seeing it as a hardship or a trial that is harmful to you and hurting you, you see the beauty behind it and you see how in the end it will help you. So if you're going through a trial, for example, instead of becoming depressed and sad and upset, you'll see beyond that. You'll see that God, who is infinitely good, gave this to you as a gift to, for example, make you better. 
or to purify you. And so you will be happy with it. And so you'll feel a sense of peace and a sense of love towards God for that blessing. And instead of seeing things that we would normally consider negative, we would see them as beautiful things and things given to us out of love. Uh, and we, we would be grateful for those things and we would feel a sense of peace. But that would force us to know God and to understand how and to understand that he's infinitely good and compassionate. And that's what we're going to talk about next class when we discuss um, getting to know God and um, falling in love with God, basically. Um, does that clarify uh, it a little bit? So, you know, it's it's just acceptance. Alhamdulillah. Yes, Alhamdulillah. Very indeed. So it's just a it's just a you know a state of acceptance, and it's a very beautiful, beautiful state, and uh, it's amazing what what is inside each and every one of us when we experience this state. Um, it it transforms everything. Um, thank you so much uh, for listening to this short talk. Uh, I really, I really, from the bottom of my heart, do appreciate it. Again, I thank Ali also uh, for giving me the platform. Um, and I really pray that you will join me uh, for the next two sessions so that we can build on this. Um, thank you. And inshallah, I pray that all of you uh, have a good rest of the night. If it's night where you are, uh, you're welcome. Uh, it was my pleasure. It was really my pleasure. Okay, inshallah, we'll see you next week. Khudafis. Thank you for listening to the Ali Podcast.